Ora si registrerà la conferenza. Good evening everyone, uh, good afternoon uh, to Mr. Jubilee. We will have uh, this uh, conversation about public-private law enforcement collaboration and the transformation of the Intelligence Fusion Center in the United States, but not only. Uh, we have, I have the pleasure to have uh, jo Joseph Billy Jr., former Vice President of Global Security at Prudential Financial, uh, retired as a FBI Assistant Director in charge of Counterterrorism Division in Washington, D.C., where the FBI were in serve for an increasing responsibility over a career that spanned over 30 years, from field security, field special agent to supervisor in a foreign and counterintelligence program, and as well to supervisor of the FBI New York City Police Department Joint Terrorist Task Force. Billy, Joseph Billy Jr. now serves as a consultant to the private and uh, sector and to the Academy on Security and Terrorism Financing Risk Management, and he's a member of the International Association of Chief of Police Committee on Homeland Security and the Real Estate Roundtable of Homeland Security Task Force. Uh, I, I will refer to Joe as a uh, as Joe, because he's been my former boss, so I will allow myself this uh, 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 liberty in this sense. Uh, Joe, you have been in the FBI. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, from uh, from Virginia. You have been in the FBI prior 9/11, and you have seen the creation of the intelligence fusion centers following those tragic events in Europe. We are not so familiar with this particular institution, so. Would you mind giving us a brief overview of the scope of such institution and uh, what is uh, their, uh, how this came about? Sure, thank you, Luca. It's a, it's a pleasure to join the Visionary Day. Thank you for having me. And uh, it's always great to work with you, Luca. So, uh, so you know, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you have to think in terms of Fusion Center as giant collectors of information. And, if you think about it in the term of, you know, where we've come as a society, uh, everyone collects information, the private sector, law enforcement, intelligence agencies. Um, everyone is collecting information daily uh, through suspicious activities, through um, incidents that may occur. Uh, where does that information go and who processes it? So the concept of a fusion center primarily was to, when everyone, when you have multiple police agencies, multiple federal agencies, multiple, uh, just a variety of collectors, who is looking at that information and saying, this is important, or this potentially has a connection to something that was reported a month ago, and we should be looking at this. So the Fusion Center concept was designed to uh, take that information into one funnel. So everyone's collecting, pulling information together, and then at a centralized basis, the information would come in, analysts would look at it and decide this is relevant to additional scrutiny, to additional inquiry. This is not or let's at least archive this information so if something were to come in a year from now that may have relevance, we can kind of pull that together. So my experience with the Fusion Center has been a steady growth process from how do you coordinate multiple agencies reporting for a ton of different information, and then how do you analyze it to sort of do it? Now, what has, I think, what has added value has been the acceptance of the private sector into the fusion center concept, where at least in the United States, initially, the fusion center was centric to law enforcement. Um, that has now broadened where law enforcement is um, embracing of private sector because the private sector collects uh, information as well through their cyber departments, through their security departments, um, that information needs to be processed and provided to the relevant agency to see if there's something there that 
could support information law enforcement may be getting, or more importantly, to let other private sector agencies know that this is a threat of concern. So the Fusion Center would be responsible for putting out a report that you would get, your colleagues would get in other industries to say, these are issues that have been reported and we're seeing similarities in information that may be of a potential threat, criminal activity, potential cyber type intrusion. So that's, that's how the Fusion Center operates. And throughout the United States, at least I can speak in terms of they're pretty prolific in different regions of the United States uh, because it has to be regionalized for the most part. Uh, and that information regionally will help to keep those industries, police departments, intelligence and other agencies informed within their regions. So when you, just for those that don't understand, the Fusion Center is a mix of state, federal and local agency law enforcement from different sources. So it's not just a, an FBI oriented or, uh, organization, but there is other law enforcement as well. Yes, that's an important point. Uh, thank you, Luca. That's uh, actually a very critical point. It's a uh, uh, collaboration of multiple agency personnel, uh, mostly at the analyst level. So, and that's another footnote to how intelligence needs to be analyzed and shared is the development of analysts that can process and talk across their individual areas of expertise, um, their different uh, sectors that they may be responsible for. Um, within, within the United States, we, we kind of break it down into different sectors. So you have transportation, you have entertainment, you have hotels, you have uh, shopping and retail. Um, you have uh, commercial buildings. So you have different sectors, sports. Um, all of those sectors have analysts that kind of focus on those particular areas. And then within the Fusion Center, it is, it's a mix of um, multiple, um, you know, it's not just FBI, it would be a multitude of, of uh, different levels of law enforcement. Uh, and again, I would say the private sector uh, analysts are also now included uh, in that fusion type center environment, which is which is really incredible if you think about it. So here you you know if you're representing a large corporation, you have confidence knowing that a member of your team is right in the middle of sharing threat information. So if something were to pertain to your particular company, you'd be the first ones to be getting good intelligence on that information. So uh, you know, we go back some time between us, but so it's connecting the dots and now these dots are shared with the, the, um, the private sector and there are these connection at the analyst level. So we are talking about really uh, analyzing uh, threat information more than uh, actionable intelligence delivery afterwards. That is correct. It's really tracking, uh, you know, just a multitude of information. Uh, a lot of it may not be relevant. You know, if you think about it, uh, a lot of information may not be relevant, but there may be pieces of information that particularly in a more sinister or serious threat, that information needs to be shared and pushed upwards. So it can one be investigated appropriately. So for example, um, I represent, you know, or anyone who's watching the presentation could represent a particular company or concern. They have information. What do they do with it? You want to be able to push it into an environment that can make sense of it and say, this is something that needs further scrutiny and it could impact other areas of industry or sectors, however you want to describe it. Thank you, Joe. You joined the FBI right out of college and uh, you then spent 30 years car of career with this institution. So you have been in a unique position to observe the changes in information and telecommunication te uh, technology. How did the Bureau entail or did anticipate the ICT transformation on, uh, during your 
30 more years with the FBI. That, that I was thinking about that. That's a, um, uh, that's a, that's a deep question in the sense of we've all kind of, you know, if you look back and you see the, uh, I would take it in different bites, uh, technology of communication. Um, two ways I would look at that. One is from an investigative standpoint, you know, how, how has intelligence and law enforcement adapted to the changes in telecommunications? So for me, it was the continued growth of communication by, we all remember paging devices, and pagers, and then how we switched to cell phones and now how voice over IP, and now we have encrypted encrypted point-to-point -point communication. So that evolvement has had really, from my perspective, law enforcement and intelligence agencies worldwide, really, had to be able to track <clears throat> and get out ahead of how criminals, terrorists, people that were insider threats to our organizations, how are they communicating? So that involvement has been tremendous. What I think now, as I look at it, uh, the challenges are much greater, uh, particularly with point-to-point -point encryption, um, uh, being able to communicate really in a way that uh, erases messages so they're no longer there and traceable. Um, for nefarious activity, um, that presents a problem to law enforcement. Internally, involvement has really adopted in the sense of uh, case management, how investigations are tracked using uh, really enhanced technology. Uh, if you think of the fusion center concept as we talked about, um, you have thousands of pieces of investigation and how does that all get synthesized in a way that can look for similarities, uh, look for coincidences, uh, and then be better processed in that area. Um, and, 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 and video teleconferencing, like we're doing now. I mean, that has been a huge growth, particularly in uh, private sector, FBI, being able to communicate around the world to uh, agents in the field and so forth in a video kind of concept way. Um, but I think, you know, in thinking about it, uh, the great challenges today are secure communication. I mean, that's what I would probably end with on that point. Yeah, I think that from uh, connecting the dots, of course, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning will help that, but then there has to be an analyst understanding if that is actionable intelligence or not. And if there, there is something to, to be done following that. Of course, we spoke with others as well about encryption and uh, new, new, uh, new way of the crime. So in a sense, the ICT brings new crime, in particular on white collar crime. So we have seen money laundering and other activity in that area. How difficult it has been to adapt the method of investigation to the evolving technology to solve the first cases? the first cases of money laundering and uh, or, or other corruption acts? I think, um, you know, without giving away, you know, a sense of uh, uh, that it's easier, in some ways it is easier. Um, uh, with the digital footprints that are left and the ability to do forensic accounting, uh, you know, really creates an environment where so much, particularly in the financial realm, is traceable. Um, we leave, with every transaction and transactionary data, we leave a tremendous amount of uh, information behind that can link to past involvement, um, connections with other individuals. Um, so in some ways, I think, I, I think, Luca, I think in some ways it may be easier in a sense, maybe more complicated because of the degree of financial um, transaction. Um, but in some ways, the ability to track and to do forensic accounting uh, is more opportunist in a sense, because you have this ability now to really 
you know, when it's when it's permanently made a record through a transaction, um, that's an easy thing to record and capture. Uh, and that information can be used to further an investigation. In in the old days, I, I speak of the old days, uh, you know, even, even way before my time, um, it was, you know, things were done with paper ledgers and, um, uh, and information was, the, a degree of record keeping may not have been to the same degree. Uh, with transactionary data today, uh, it's amazing to the extent of the information you can find uh, and help to solve crimes, help to identify uh, nefarious individuals that may be part of a larger scheme. Yeah, I think that everybody knows or everybody is aware, either because they, they have studied or because they have seen the movies that Al Capone was arrested because of money and uh, tax evasion and not for other crime that became came afterwards. But we were talking earlier with, uh, with uh, Neil Wall from UNODC, so as well about this. So in the fight against international terrorism and organized crime, the law enforcement strategy has been to follow the money trail in countering the financing of terrorist group and criminal acts, money laundering, uh, or rock state that they were using money to, to force or to support uh, uh, the criminal act. How big of an impact is the cryptocurrency in performing such activity nowadays for the, for the FBI or for any law enforcement as you have a very good connection on? I think um, when you think of cryptocurrency and you think of blockchain, uh, blockchain technology and distributed ledgers, uh, all of those are here to stay. Um, it's, go, it, it's going to be increasingly a part of banking. Um, you know, if you look at the um, degree that major banks around the world are adopting, to using cryptocurrency and being able to, um, you know, I mean, you could buy a car with Bitcoin today in some, in, you know, in some dealerships, for example. Uh, so, so I think starting out and putting that on the front end, yes, it's a, it's it's going to become more mainstream. I think perhaps there's activity in the sense of new coin offerings and so forth that may be less than. Um, um, truthful in the sense, so I think there's going to be a degree of sorting out uh, when new coins are uh, put to market, uh, the investment into those and so forth needs scrutiny because there is a lot of fraud in the whole ecosystem of cryptocurrency. So uh, that being said, from a criminal perspective, uh, it's a factor. It's not an overwhelming factor from my perspective at this point in time. Um, I think it's there is a degree of use of it, certainly in dark web activity for uh, narcotic purchases. And, and, and we've seen cases like that. There's been some major investigations around the world uh, that have shown the use of dark web activity and uh, illicit goods being purchased through cryptocurrency. Um, from a terrorism perspective, perhaps less of a um, of, of a hard concern at this point. I think I, I think it's on the radar, but I do not see it as an overwhelming way of moving money to this point in time. And the other thing I think, and I think you know, there are more there. Are there are probably people listening in on our presentation who could speak much more to this, but um, it does not necessarily mean if you're going to have a transaction using Bitcoin, for example, that that's untraceable. Um, that transactionary data is also with your digital wallet, which with the blockchain uh, still has legacy type information that is recorded and is archived. So it's not completely anonymous as perhaps some people would think. So, um, you know, and I'll stop at that because, uh, again, that goes into a deeper topic, um, you know, certainly. But, um, but, but I think it's a concern. It's on the radar. And I would say 
to answer your question specifically, uh, certainly with regards to uh, criminal activity, it is something that's used, um, particularly on the dark. Yes, thank you, thank you, Joe. Uh, you know, after you you left the FBI, you joined the private sector with one of the leading financial institutions for about over a 10 year period with international presence. You have been uh, uh, one of the, the key factors on creating ongoing collaboration within the law enforcement and the fusion center in New Jersey and, uh, and, in, uh, and in New York. You already mentioned the presence of the private sector. Uh, would you just maybe briefly explain how this is working nowadays? Is, uh, is uh, there is actually a person physically being in the fusion center in New Jersey or New York? From the private sector, I mean. Yeah, a lot of it's done uh, virtually now, obviously, because of you know, you know what we're all dealing with. So a lot of it is virtual, uh, but the linkages are there. What uh, in, in 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 my old company, for example, they um, the local fusion center, which was run by the state police agency for the region, um, created designated. Fusion, fusion Center liaison officers, and they designated a variety of people as those liaisons to the Fusion Center. And as I mentioned in our first piece of our presentation, um, that incorporation of the private sector was very, very significant. So private sector analysts have been uh, essentially trained uh, deputized is probably the word I would use as liaison analysts. So they have that connectivity back into the fusion center for information exchange. And, and, and the way it would work is um, something happens if you represent a company that has a worldwide presence and something happens you're immediately asking your liaison contact at the fusion center, are they picking up anything on this particular uh, incident or any type of intelligence that could be of significance so you can protect your assets uh, within your corporation. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, it's a regular exchange. Um, I want to say daily, sometimes several times a day. And then, if there is a major incident when things get what they call different levels of operation, then those people would then be physically sitting in one location and uh, and really you know working together or sharing the information. So uh, it depends on the degree of readiness and what you need. So uh, and, and it's not just crime and terrorism and cyber threats. It could be a major natural disaster. Um, so a typhoon or a hurricane or a major storm of some type could affect uh, operations uh, dramatically. And the Fusion Center is part of collecting that information about sources of fuel and food and housing, uh, transportation, road closures, all of that. So having that plug-in with the personnel uh, you get an immediate uh, exchange of information. You know, you know, you know. One thing I would say, Luca. Um, you know, going back to a long time ago now, but after the 9/11 attacks, which uh, someone, someone on this uh, exchange may remember, others may just be born when they happened. So, um, but what the one thing that occurred within the United States was the development. Uh, and, and I'm digressing just a little bit, but was the concept of joint terrorism task forces. And uh, I just want to say that because that was a novel concept uh, to particularly many uh, of our partners in Europe who would have multiple agencies and were trying to see how they would be working terrorist threats and so forth. And when I was uh, in the FBI hosting countless delegations of different representatives from European law enforcement intelligence agencies that would come to the United States to see the Joint Terrorism Task Force concept. And really what that was, was bringing 
different levels of investigators from different agencies to work under one roof together um, using federal uh, law primarily, but using the, the connectivity and the resources of multiple agencies working together, essentially a partnership. Uh, and that concept of coming together was really the start of the build out of fusion centers later on and the way information started to develop in a more grand scale. So I just wanted to say that because it's, uh, when you think in terms of sharing, again, we're all collectors of information, but me just holding on to that information and not getting it to a place where it could have a greater good is, uh, is short-sighted. So you need to think in terms of how can you bring intelligence information together. Yeah, 9-11 has been uh, really a, a turning point on law enforcement, and I know how 9-11 is very close to your heart. So I, I, I really think that there, is a, there was a, a need for innovation that came similar to what we are observing now with COVID-19, where there was a need of innovation. We, we have to innovate the way we present, like visionary day to days or how we do business. So definitely there, there was a change. I just wanted to go back because I, I think for the people that they are following us is, uh, so the, the, these people, these analysts that come from the private sector that they are deputized is they, they get the security clearance. So there is a, a scrutiny before actually they get access to those, those information. Yes, there is a degree, depending on the agency. Um, yes. Um, so at the state level, it would be, um, uh, a degree of public trust type security clearance. So, so yes, there is a degree of vetting that goes on depending on the agency. So uh, those coming into work with the FBI obviously would need a much greater level of national clearance because of the level of information. Um, and again, not to confuse, but uh, at, a, at a lower level, perhaps at a state level um, representation, uh, that level of clearance may not have the same degree, but still, they're not going. I mean, this is, these are trusted partnerships, and trusted uh, and trusted is important because the sensitivities of information that is being exchanged. So you're correct. As we uh, moving to the cybercrime and the new that is actually you know, on the news every day. We have uh, every day there is a little bit of a some sort of larger or smaller cyber attack. Did the, you mention it at the beginning, but I just wanted to go back on that is, did the Fusion Center brought those elements uh, on their daily uh, analysis, their daily connecting the dots, that is the typical work of the, the analysts at the Fusion Center? That the, the cyber piece is kind of spun off in, for the most part, at least from my experience, uh, as a separate entity in the sense because of the specialty involved in cybercrime. Um, within the fusion center I'm describing, there's a specialty area. Um, it's called the cyber integration cell. So it's a standalone entity within the fusion concept that focuses specifically on cyber issues affecting uh, a multitude of sectors. And their job is to work with the Fusion Center when information comes in, but be more granular in how they look at that information. So, for example, um, the fault has been for years, particularly in the private sector, is if I am being probed or we have suspicion within my company of a distributed malware attack or um, something that may be ransomware related or along those lines, uh, the conventional thought was you keep that to yourself and you kind of work it, you deal with it, but you, but you deal with it. The new thinking on this is that the people trying to do harm, the bad people, they don't care they're going to ping as many corporations as possible until they get through and find a weak entry point. They don't really care. They don't care that it's me or it's you or another company. They just want to get access and get in and exploit. And so those threats that are coming in, 
um, it's no longer prudent to kind of keep it to yourself and to kind of just go it alone. So the idea of the of the integration cell is to take the information, encourage reporting from private sector, from other organizations that are that are experiencing potential cyber attacks, and then get that information out so it could be defensively uh, handled across the board. Because if I if I'm being attacked and this is what we're being attacked with, and these are the signatures, it would be very valuable to you from your cyber side to be able to be looking for it and to be aware of it or to put up um, whatever type of defenses you need to do internally. So that's the idea of integrating cyber information. It's no longer, uh, you know, let's keep it to ourselves. Let's get that information into the fusion center so it can be distributed more broadly and it can help protect a greater swath of potential victims that, uh, again, the, uh, the bad actors normally don't care. They're, they're just looking to get in and exploit wherever they find a weakness and they're gonna hit all of us. So we might as well kind of link arms and put up a unified defense to try to block this. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Then when it comes to cyber, we need to share uh, the different uh, threat actors and uh, the rock state or the proxy state that allow that and the source of the attack as quicker and as broader as possible. I just want to maybe move uh, to another and then I will connect the dots as well. But in Europe, of course, uh, a lot of people, the public knows the FBI Academy in Quantico from movie and TV and US series, of course. And uh, there is this uh, aura of what it is. So I know you have been involved with the Academy in, in a number in a number of uh, occasions and in different roles. So what is the actually the FBI Academy? And uh, does this FBI Academy exist outside the, 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 uh, the United States? And if that, uh, how it does work? Sure. The, I'm, I'm very proud of the FBI Academy in a sense, and you know that, Luca, because we've you know talked about it. I think I, I think you even took a tour there once, if I recall. I think you went there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, from 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 my perspective, um, it has several elements to it. One is you know training uh, uh, FBI personnel, but let's put that to the side. I think one of the great values of the FBI Academy is what we call the National Academy. And there may be some on this presentation who recognize that word. That's a, basically it's a 10 week program of a multitude of law enforcement personnel that come to the FBI Academy and essentially take uh, co college level academics, but work together in an environment that forges partnerships. So, and that has been ongoing for many, many, many decades. Um, and the degree of connectivity internationally is to me, one of the great strengths. Uh, I have a directory of information of graduates of the National Academy worldwide. And all I would need to do is call any of these individuals and I'm immediately partnered with them because they shared in the same environment that I shared in. So if you think about sharing information and having that worldwide connectivity, that is uh, an amazing, I think, thing and it's, and it's continuing. I mean, obviously COVID has slowed down, but uh, eventually that'll be restarted. But 400 police officials from around the world gathering for 10 weeks every four times a year, different groups. You think about how many year after year of those partnerships that are formed. Um, the other thing, uh, which is uh, you know, maybe known, maybe not, but in Budapest, Hungary, is the International Law Enforcement Academy. It's an arm of the FBI Academy, and it is... Um, Basically, it's a partnership with the Hungarian National Police uh, to bring in police executives from throughout Europe who train 
together in a collegiate environment to again to form those partnerships. Um, and that's a something that again is an institution that builds these worldwide relationships uh, which we all need. And that uh, and that's one thing I think from my perspective continues to be really one of the strong points of, uh, of you know not only policing today and intelligence work today, but it's that ability to have that really international connectivity of partnerships that can bring information uh, to help solve crimes. Uh, and, and, and really it's being done around the world. So uh, very significant. So just to make sure that everybody around the, around the table or virtually around the table understand is there is no just, uh, let's say, uh, police tactics, but there is as well executive level and uh, uh, higher level education for the different rank of the different police around the world that join the FBI. It's not just policing uh, on the car and the patrolling. There is different level. There is management level as well of education. That's a, that's a really insightful point. It's, uh, it's geared, most of these academy level training programs are geared not to new recruits, uh, not to the person riding around walking on the street. It's geared towards the up and coming executives. So those that are in a mid to upper level position, um, many times not the head of the agency uh, who you know may be there for or maybe retiring or whatever the case may be. But it's for those that are in line to assume greater positions of leadership. So the theory being is that you're preparing them to be better prepared basically to do their job um, when they move into more executive type positions. So, so it's really like for mid to upper level uh, managers. And, um, and again, those, individuals that have shown the prerequisite to um, move into greater positions of responsibility. Uh, and it'll be around a while. So you don't wanna have somebody go through the, the training and spend the 10 weeks and acquire all this knowledge and friendships and go back to their home country and then decide, oh, I'm gonna leave now. It doesn't, it doesn't serve, but if they're there for another four, five, six, seven years, then those partnerships that they developed, and there's refresher training too. That's once you attend these programs, uh, there's always refreshers. Um, there's um, there's different international gatherings that are held uh, yearly to bring graduates together. So while we're sitting here, you know, doing our presentation, we should take comfort in knowing that those partnerships have really blossomed and are continuing. Uh, again, you know, notwithstanding our present um, situation, but, yeah. uh, but, but we know those partnerships move on. So maybe as we are uh, during the visionary days uh, here in Switzerland and, uh, and you are joining from the US, so how the FBI or the academy or, or the management, let's say, anticipate changes on the actual management of the, the, the law enforcement and the, the let's say the, the digitalization of the processes, the different processes that you have mentioned it before. Is there is an office that looks at that or there is a group of people that look at changes, change management, how they say in the private sector? I think uh, I think there is. I uh, you know I've been out a little bit bit of time now, so even in the time that I've been out and have moved to private sector, uh, uh, change is continuous, and an agency has to evolve, uh, has to continue to grow in a sense to face the current threat environment, um, to face both not only technology challenges uh, but also social challenges that may be. Uh, presented. So those are always always looked at in a sense. And there's always offices within, you know, certainly within the FBI that is looking towards uh, being futuristic, so to speak. Uh, I know it doesn't, you know, coming from the US federal government, that's seen sometimes as very bureaucratic and slow to move. And that's all true. It's, it's a large organization and a large government. 
but within, uh, if you're not thinking about up, you know, how threats evolve and really what should we be looking for? To what degree is the social media contribute to issues? To what degree does um, personal encryption devices create to making it difficult to solve crimes? To what degree does digital currency, cryptocurrency, um, and other new ways of moving money, how does that impact the ability to trace? So all those things are continuously thought about. And then on top of that is looking for priorities. So what are what would be your investigative priorities? Because that's where you send your resources. So, you know, within the FBI, it's still primarily uh, preventing terrorist attack is still the number one priority. But I can tell you that there's many priorities that fall right under it, which are always being looked at and evaluated. So field commanders know how to spend their resources to address those priorities. Yes, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you need to have an investment plan like in the private sector, and you need to decide priority allocation of human resources, time, and, and financial resources. So you, you have a, a long career in the, in the law enforcement and intelligence and the security world, and you were mentioning new, tra new threats, uh, the, the, the upcoming, the future threats. So maybe as we come to, to a close of the conversation, but what uh, are, in your view, in your personal view, the new trend, the new risk that you have observed and that you think that they are on their horizon in the public and in the in the private sector. I think um, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I can say that my sense of it is, and in talking with with other individuals as well, uh, and this would be worldwide, um, we've adopted to a new way of working. And for some of us, that's this new way of working may be long term. Uh, for many corporations, um, there's an evaluation or a reevaluation of real estate. You know, do I have a workforce now that can primarily work remotely? Um, do I need to have the large corporate campus? Do I need to have a large building that uh, where I don't need to have that? So. Uh, so that reevaluation, I think, is going to, in many ways, probably create a new uh, paradigm of how we operate, and that's going to be teleworking for many. With teleworking comes new threats and challenges, and once you move information outside of the secure perimeter of a internal network, uh, internal computers. Uh, internal networking devices and so forth and move information sharing now to someone's kitchen or their bedroom, that creates in and of itself potentially a easier way for the people we were talking about before to try to get in and attack networks and so forth, acquire sensitive insider information, steal your technology, steal your trade secrets, uh, and produce it someplace else at a third of the cost, and uh, and there we go. So, I think that's to me is a um, new type of threat that we quite haven't understood yet, but we have to be aware of it, and that's going to be a collective effort. Some corporations have done great work in their whole workforce can work remotely, and many have good security systems in place but it's only as good as your ability to store and secure sensitive information in your home. Uh, if you're gonna be teleworking for the next six months to one year or for much longer than that. So that's a threat that is there. Taking that to the side and looking at the, um, the amount of time individuals are online, uh, certainly during this time frame presents those that want to uh, either push threat, in, threat ideas or uh, perhaps try to recruit people to become 
into a threat environment, it's much more easy to do because you're online all the time, you're searching, you're engaging on social media. So that door opens a little larger, a little wider, uh, and allows those that are more vulnerable to perhaps become um, recruitable uh, into a, a terrorist threat environment, certainly. So I think those are the two things that come to mind, but I think the thing that's primary to me is this uh, entire future of teleworking for many uh, areas of our workforce, our industries, many with sensitive information, and then how do we secure that uh, in the days and years ahead once we leave our perimeter of security? Yeah, I think the discussion has been on the table for some time. Where is the perimeter of a new corporation, new institution, where it hands, and how do you protect uh, the perimeter of information? So. Uh, the secure operation uh, of uh, protecting information. We, we talk about digital information, but of course, uh, during lockdown, if you print a classified document because that's the way you like to read it and you forgot to shred it or to, to right. store it correctly, then, uh, then you expose the, 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 your house to burglary that they are not related to your burglary because your house, but because you have a laptop that uh, has a classified information in it. So I think this is a new paradigm that, and I agree with you, Joe, that a number of corporations have kind of like underestimated. Uh, there is a number of institutions as well, the institution where I'm advising currently that have underestimated the fact that now we are carrying more and more and more frequently uh, classified information in secure, store a laptop maybe but then it's always available so i think that is a, a change of paradigm and this is important to bring it to the table as well in in this uh, this environment which is visionary day so we come to a conclusion of our conversation i don't want to take too much time of your i know you 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 need to go back to work but uh so visionary day how is important for this type of platform to discuss uh, public and private collaboration it's unique, the fact that we, we can discuss law enforcement and intelligence collaboration, but do, how do you think this will fit in, a, in, a, in such a, a, an event like Visionary Day? I think, uh, you know, to sum it up, I, I think, first of all, I think this is essential. These, these conversations, and I'm sure the other conversations that you've had throughout the program are absolutely essential for um, at least thinking about perhaps building greater partnerships. And if I were to leave one strong message, you know, of everything that we've talked about is that no one agency can protect themselves uh, from vulnerabilities alone. And no one agency is able to uh, navigate through a threat environment without having an alliance of partnerships. Visionary Day, I think, is certainly pointed in that right direction. You're bringing individuals together from different disciplines, different types of thought uh, that look at this from not only their own perspective, but perhaps maybe think in terms of, you know, how can, how can some of the things we've talked about here be promoted within any one of our participants in own personal environments. Um, so, and I think, in, in, you know, in some ways too, um, you need to be sort of adaptable and also um, be open to exploring new ideas of partnerships. I mean, for me, the hardest thing was, you know, you know we, we use the phrase share till it hurts. Um, and for the FBI, that has always been a closed agency. Uh, I'm not going to say, you know, it's all secretive. We're not going to share. That's no longer. It's it, now it's really, even with the private sector, the FBI tries to share until it hurts um, because they'll only be as good as their partner constituents can be prepared and be able to um, interface with them in a way that's very helpful. So I would say um, 
from visionary days perspective, being able to promote partnerships that are formed here to be thinking about it and to say, how can we collaborate a little better, maybe collectively uh, form, maybe starting out informally and then maybe formalize a degree of intelligence sharing uh, among different agencies. And I don't have enough experience with everyone that's connected here on the platform. Uh, if I did, I'd be able to maybe do that. But I think hopefully the message is, you know, think in terms of collaboration. Yes, thank you very much, Joe. Yeah, well, the idea of Visionary Day is actually collaboration, trans uh, function, not just a law enforcement and chatting between law enforcement people, but really across a very large spectrum of uh, uh, institution, organization, and others. So. Uh, I just opened the floor for one one or two questions. If there is any question, please. I, I asked before if uh, there is any question, just send it to me on uh, on the on the chat. Uh, if there is no question, of course, so we are more than and you know I know there's going to be a lot of questions if we were face to face, but uh, it's always difficult on the on this. So. Um, there is no question. Uh, I, I think it's out of respect as well for you, Joe. So, Joe, I just wanted to thank you very much. I know that we tried again to have you in my hometown. This was, we failed again. Oh, we have one question. Hold on. Hold on. Um, oh, this is a difficult one. Uh, uh, okay, I will ask that and let's see if uh, you want to answer, Joe. Uh, E2E encryption, hand-to-hand uh, -hand encryption, don't you think wiretapping was so easy on the internet in the old days that has been abused as an antibiotic for common sinusitis? Nice phrase. For prosecutor, uh, uh, I will jump on that. A mass surveillance scheme impacting privacy and as uh, this created a mass reaction. So basically the end-to-end -end encryption has become a uh, an antibiotic to mass uh, uh, or non-approve uh, uh, wiretaping on the on the internet. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, I think the FBI uses a term called "going dark," um, which means that in many ways, law enforcement is. Um, basically goes dark because of end-to-end -end encryption. So the ability to be able to, um, with at least within the United States, with an approved federal court order signed by a magistrate judge, um, should be allowable to acquire information. Um, that's becoming more difficult because if the information is unobtainable, either because the um, encryption has done away with what was sent or there's no archivable information or uh, the service provider will not allow access for their own reasons. How do you, how do you adjust your, um, your law enforcement abilities to prevent acts of terrorism, prevent criminal activity, and you can think broadly on criminal activity, how do you prevent that when you can't um, do a sufficient type of wiretap? Um, there's still quite a bit of information available, uh, so it's not like you're completely uh, uh, blocked from, from everything. But the point-to-point -point encryption does present challenges for law enforcement, not just in the United States, but worldwide. And my sense of it is, is um, when when law enforcement agencies acquire through judicial process the information needed to prevent a crime or solve a crime then there should be a degree of being able to acquire that information so uh, that's a much larger discussion i think to the person asking it but that's that's the initial take on it thank you joe we have a second question from paul uh he uh, concur with you, Joe, to your statement related to collaboration, and he thanks you. But what incentive do you recommend to public sector to give to private sector to share and collaborate even more rather than to stay secretive? 
and how to increase trust in public-private partnership? That's a great question. Um, and I think the, uh, the thing I mentioned at the front end of the conversation um, is that the private sector is collectors as well. So if you think, if we think back and we think of intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies, we know they're collectors of information. That's what they do. Uh, they're always out acquiring different types of information to help uh, improve quality of life, prevent crimes, all of that. Within the private sector, um, the private sector acquires that information also. So through suspicious activity that may be um, uh, presented to the company, through an employee who may be creating a particular problem or have a concern that's come to internal security's um, um, uh, awareness. So having those types of pieces of information and many, many more too, um, and you can think in terms of your, of, of your own areas of responsibility in your own company, you know, the things that you see on the cyber end, uh, information um, that comes in that could be suspicious or uh, needs further inquiry. So to build that partnership, the private sector needs to have an open mind and be able to share that information. Certainly, uh, you know, Luca, from the company we worked with, Prudential, um, we, we were able to share quite a bit of information with law enforcement. Uh, huge company, um, worldwide footprint, uh, tens of thousands of employees, uh, and that brings information in. An employee could have something that they bring to their local security because they don't want to go to the law enforcement and maybe they want to share it with security as a concern. Well, that may be something that we decide needs to go to law enforcement. Uh, so having that ability to be confident and have that partnership that you can get that information to is key to, I think, building the relationship. Know you're a collector. Know you have valuable information that you acquire just through the course of your daily uh, work. And some of that information may be of value to law enforcement. Um, not all of it, but occasionally there's pieces of information. I mean, an example that really helped, I think, um, to build the partnership back in the day was uh, there was a individual I could speak a little bit about was photographing very suspiciously um, different aspects of our, our buildings uh, in, in, our, in, in one of our major cities. And our surveillance cameras had detected this individual and had very good images of them. Um, that information, we captured it and provided it to the fusion center. So private sector collected, said here, here's an individual that just didn't look right. It just, it just seemed odd, came in different cars with out of, you know, out of area license plates. Um, the fusion center looked at this information and they were able to determine that the same individual was looking at other critical infrastructure sites over the course of about a four month period of time in two other areas, not even anywhere near where our buildings were located. So they essentially opened up an investigation. I believe they gave it to the FBI because it was, uh, it rose to that level. And the FBI conducted an investigation into this individual to determine if they were targeting for attack, targeting to strike a particular, you know, what was the softest target when they were doing their homework. So um, that's an example of how that partnership grew. And if you didn't share the information, you'd hear about it. It's like, well, you were sitting on this and you had something of value and you didn't share it. It's like, this could help. So that's how you kind of want to build it. A little bit yeah thank you Joe and maybe if I had my my uh, two cents of in of information is actually based on trust if we share information from a public perspective or from the private sector perspective toward the the, the law enforcement and vice versa what the trust is based on the fact that if with that information is shared it doesn't go further than where he has to be so the need to know time to know concept and, uh, and that is based over years of collaboration and really 
establishing that. Joe, I want to thank you very, very much to joining us. I, uh, I think we had a very nice conversation and we had a number of people joining in and a good question as well. So I just want to thank you and wish you a good day. And uh, thank you everybody for joining in and talk to you soon. Thank you for having me. Good night, everyone.